All right, Sue Terry, thanks for joining us. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, Graham. Good. Hey, Jerry. I've been looking forward to this. I've been reading. I've been reading some uh, some old sort of ancient ancient uh, or writings about ancient uh, wisdom and 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 music and sound keeps coming up. So I'm looking forward to to chatting with you about the power and the metaphysics of music. Excellent. It's it's a fascinating subject and it's one that people don't really discuss very much and especially even in music school where you think you would think that people would talk about it it's not discussed at all Darren Darren used to like he's been a, a bit of a musician I have no musical talent at all whatever so I have no theory like I don't even understand like the theory of it and I can't play I've when school I hated it I couldn't play it um, but I love listening to it I love like like singing on my own in the shower or in the car, you know, it resonates with me. It makes me cry. I mean, it's, it has a powerful effect on me. So I think like most people probably have that relationship to music, but just so you know, I have no experience or, or, you know, a theory about music at all. Well, what about cool. you? Did you learn that Darren, when you were, when you were playing in your band there for a while? Did I learn what? Sorry. Like music, the theory of it, like how. No, you, no I can't even read music. Yeah. I can't read what music. Play, though, Darren, what's your instrument? Uh, I could play anything if you give me enough time with it, but I i mean, I don't play anything, if I'm being perfectly honest right now. I got a bunch of guitars hanging up downstairs that I could, I could, uh, um, that's what you yeah. played in the band, right? Yeah, that's what I, I played bass in the band, actually. Bass, okay. But I could do drums and stuff too. The, the guitar is the funnest, but. I definitely don't play it by any stretch. I probably haven't touched it in like six months. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we we will still have an interesting discussion. Oh, for sure. I mean, so when did you when did you get interested in the power of music or the metaphysical aspect of it? I Has would it say, uh, you know, the th I've been playing music since I was five years old, and um, I started to. Uh, just from being a professional musician, you know, and being in so many different situations of playing, I started to notice things. And also, I, um, I have a, a long background in studying spirituality and metaphysical subjects. You know, my father gave me Carlos Castaneda's first book when I was 15, you know, so that was like my Bible and uh, then I, I read all those books. I started to read a lot of Eastern mysticism, Eastern religions. And I uh, studied the, the fourth way work of Gurdjieff, which I still am actively uh, involved with, with a spiritual group that studies that. And, and also I have been practicing Tai Chi for more than 30 years. So all of that stuff just started to dovetail after a while. And, you know, you, you there's things in your life where you do this thing over here, you do that thing over there, but they, at a certain point, they all start to come together. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about Gurdjieff because I'm, I found, I have to dig up this old book. My, my dad had that book way back when. So I remember that book on our bookshelf as a kid the fourth way. And, um, and I, and I thought I listened to this podcast. It was fascinating with two really prominent sort of magicians, like Western, like uh, in a very studying various modalities of, you know, Western magic and Eastern mysticism. And it was Jason Lube and Greg Kaminsky. And they, they talked about how inevitably when you go down even either one Western magic or Eastern mysticism, it leads back to it leads them back to Gurdjieff. Like people end up back at Gurdjieff. So why why did you why would why would was there something about that that resonated with you? Resonated with you? Pardon um, well, first of all, I love Jason Lou. The the other um, person you mentioned, I'm not familiar with, but uh, I started to read In Search of the Miraculous. That was probably my introduction to Gurdj the Gurdjieff work when I was around, I don't know, 22, 23 years old. So th it, it just struck a chord. It, you know, Gurdjieff himself said that he was teaching esoteric Christianity 
which is interesting. He, he never mentioned uh, the word magic or anything like that. But when you look at what he, the things that he was talking about, see, when, when now we separate everything now, right? Like everything is labeled, uh, categorized. and Yeah. And back in the day, it wasn't like that. You know, John D., who was the, the personal advisor to Queen Elizabeth, the first in the 16th century you know he was an an astrologer he was he did medicine he was a mathematician he did occult stuff he spoke with spirits it was all just investigating you know which now it's all i don't know science really like you know how people say oh follow the science right but a scientist never says that because science is all about investigation, you know. So, um, when you in, when you are about investigation, you're not separating things. You're saying, "Oh, that's that appears to be happening. Let me go investigate that." So, it. I think everything needs to be a lot more integrated, and and maybe we're moving into the next phase now. Uh, that you know, speaking of. Jason Louvre, who's um, into uh, chaos magic and stuff. There's another guy named Lionel Snell. He's yep. also, he has another name, Ramsey Dukes. So we had him on. I think we had him on. Darren, Darren, didn't we have him on way, way back, like many years oh, ago? I got to check. I got to check out that show because he's amazing. He's an incredible scholar. So he says that humanity goes through these cyclical um, stages of um, religion, magic, art, and science. And it keeps cycling through. So we're kind of in the science now, right? But we're moving into the magic. And you can just, you could tell that from the TV shows, you know, oh, like yeah. X and stuff. Um, people are very, very interested and fascinated by paranormal things. So maybe we're, in this transition period now where we're moving more towards magic, which I think is included in the heading of metaphysics. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I like it because I feel like we've been stuck in a, in a bit of a, you know, they were fighting quite hard in the 1800s against the dogma of, of science and the church. You know, there was a huge movement, the spiritualism and the theosophy movements and really trying to look for sort of a middle a middle truth or a middle way that wasn't so dogmatic and maybe, you know, and, and I feel like it got squashed after world war one specifically. Um, but I mean, it, I guess it was a, sort of a long time coming since the enlightenment, which I would consider more of like a darkening, but maybe we're, maybe we're reaching that point where now, now it's kind of breaking through again, because you're right. I mean, all the, all the amount of people that are sort of into the new age stuff, but also the occult and the, and the magic part and all the TV shows and, and people really opening up even, even just about UFOs. I mean, since we've been podcasting for 10 years, people used to send us stories and all that. And the, really the, the, the whole environment's changed quite a bit. Yeah, I think, and in terms of, of music, it, it really makes perfect sense to talk about metaphysics and music together because music is just this really amazing, magical thing. We don't even know where it comes from. It's, uh, it's just something amazing. I never cease to be amazed at the, at the power of it and the mysterious origin of it. Um, you know, when you learn an instrument, you, you're, you're usually you're a kid. Right. And you hear this music and you're like, wow, that's amazing. I want to do that. And then you you get an instrument and you start practicing it and you start trying to play music. I remember when I was 12 playing Charlie Parker records on the turntable because there were no CDs then. Right. We're talking the 1970s. So I would play this. Charlie Parker record on the turntable and I would be like oh it just sounds like he's playing kind of random notes and then I would try to do it I would just play random notes but it didn't sound like him 
And so it was this magical thing. Like when you see a magic trick, when you see Chris Angel or when you see the Carbonaro effect or something and you're, you're amazed, like, how, how are they doing that? How is that possible? And that's how it was. That, that's how it is with music. When you're learning music, you just want to do it because it seems like this magical thing. Do you think a lot of people that write music have the intuitive gift or they're in the flow? They, they, they're they doing downloads. Like, are they getting some help like, with that? I mean. Oh, you mean like automatic writing type well, of thing? Well, kind of, or, or, or even just, um, even just, I don't think automatic writing so much, but I just wonder how, like, I can't even imagine, I can't picture how somebody would even write music. Um, so I, I can't like, for example, and I, what it comes to me as friends of ours called the brothers of the serpent, they, they, they made this album called, uh, uh, procession and it, and it had a really strong effect on me emotionally. Like, first of all, I, I didn't really expect it to be so good coming from just podcast friends. Like, but it was very professionally done, independent, re independently recorded. And and I guess it, it was just weird because I'm like, these guys that we know like made this amazing album and I just didn't really realize that they had it in them, right? But I mean, they've just got this talent for songwriting, writing the music, writing the lyrics, right? And I guess, I don't even know where I'm going with that. It's just it's just something that um, I can't, I, I just can't imagine doing it. Well, first of all, a band is more than the sum of its parts. And that's really the power of a band because um, that, that's why the music industry tries to break up bands all the time. You know, like they take the lead singer and give them a solo contract and they, they try to break up the band. Or they say, uh, you know what, well, let's just take the singer and the guitar player and then we'll fill in with studio musicians. They do that all the time. Because the industry is afraid of the power of bands. And we've seen... Um, the power of bands. We've seen the power of, of the Beatles, of, of the Stones, of Miles Davis's band, of, you know, so many, right? The Grateful Dead, Frank Zappa. We've seen this. And in order to, um, and, and, and the reason for it is because a band is more than the sum of its parts. When you get together, that chemistry, that combination of musicians elevates the ability of everyone in the band because it's like you're joining forces. It's like a sports team, really. Yeah, that's a good, good analogy. Did you see a change in the music scene from, not that you're in, involved in pop music at all or anything like that, but I feel like the eighties was a pretty special time with music. Um, it seemed like anybody could kind of had access to kind of come up with a creative album and put it out there or a song like the one hit wonders from the eighties. But then in the nineties, it kind of got, you know, it, it, you've got all these conspiracies about the record labels sort of controlling the message for the rap and, and kind of, did you, did you notice, have you noticed like a huge change in the way music is, is uh, controlled from the top like that? I think it was always controlled but now they have more control and what is upsetting to me as a as an artist is that musicians don't realize the power that they have they have incredible power you know we're basically the ar arbiters of the vibrations you know the, the, the this vibratory phenomenon that actually goes into people's bodies you know and changes them. It transforms people. So they've always wanted to control the musicians, but now the, I don't know, the musicians keep giving away their, their power to people in the music industry who a lot of times don't even know very much about music at all. And yet they're the ones calling the shots, you know, and it's disappointing and it's it's kind of upsetting and there are i think a few people who are trying a few musicians who are trying to correct that situation but basically we're in between paradigms right now right the old the old paradigm of you know talent scouts and stuff 
and the the cream will rise to the top you know that doesn't happen anymore you could live and die and be a genius and no one will ever hear of you and everything is kind of forced on the artist now you have to do your own publicity you have to get your the audience to come to the gig you got to do your own promotion everything is and, and it's kind of a trickle down from the from other industries as well because you notice um in many other areas the customer is responsible for everything the companies don't take any responsibility at all and so this is the same thing as happening in music, you know. So I don't know. We're we're really in between paradigms now. Yeah, that's interesting because what are I mean? I guess another great thing about this album that had such an emotional effect on me, and and I still listen to it. Like it, it is like one of my favorite albums, and it's from you know our friends that made it. I mean, it's unbelievable. Like it's as some of the songs are as good as you know I could expect from a from a song, um, and. They did it on their own, independently recorded. They didn't go with a label. They did value for value. Like, basically, they put it out there. They put out all the, the instrumental and the whole thing for people to use however they wish. Um, I don't know what you think about this 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 uh, process or this theory, but... And then they and then they asked for people to donate, buy it, and then, they, you know, and then I guess people can buy it. I guess people would buy it. Like, they'd get it on their Apple if they have Apple Music and Spotify. Like, it's available everywhere, but... They're not really selling it, but they did. This album did better than their other other albums that had they had to follow the the labels, you know, um, uh, instructions and and uh, protocols and stuff. And these guys just did this exactly how they wanted. They had complete creative control over it. They made it exactly. They made it. They I think they rented really really good recording equipment. They did it all themselves. So maybe that's a good sign that people are willing to to do that. I mean, do you? Do you like that? Or what do you think of that process? Yeah, they had a vision. And and they saw their vision through to the end. They didn't let their vision get co-opted by the record company. And and that's uh, that's why it was successful. Um, I mean, the, the record company can, can kill a project. Uh, and um, I know that, uh, at least in, in jazz the record companies they operate on a failure model because they make money regardless if if you're if your album tanks they don't care they they still make money off it i've seen um people show me royalty statements where they owe the record company money wow. because it's it's all it's all recoupable um all the expenses for the recording studio and everything uh, that that comes right off the top so you don't see a dime. The artist doesn't see a dime until all of those recoupable expenses that, that are in the contract are taken care of. Uh, it, it's not really a great model. Yeah. So I, I got a quote here from, I wanted to, you know, you talked about the, the like what started music, like the beginning of it or whatever. Um, there's, I was reading Manly P. Hall's uh, magazine from the early 1900s and he's got, He's talking about, you know, how Orpheus uh, was accredited with the construction of the seven string lyre. And then it gets into the Greek mysteries and how they they didn't consider it to be a basic art. They uh, regarded it as dependent upon mathematics. So, in fact, among the ancients, um, they actually included in their doctrines a remarkable concept concerning the relationship of music to form. Now, I don't know if this is true, but I'd, I'd like your take on it. The elements of architecture, for example, were considered as comparable to musical notes or as having a musical counterpart. So consequently, when building when a building was erected in which a number of these elements were combined, the structure was then likened to a musical chord, which chord was harmonic only when it was fully satisfied by the mathematical requirements of harmonic intervals. So like they said that thus a certain chord was said to be the keynote of the edifice. And they talk about how you know, the, the priests and stuff, they would be able to whisper or sing a few notes and it would, they would resonate through the whole, the whole temple. And I mean, and I, and I was wondering, like, I also was reading about how often they used music in the healing temples. Um, as a, as a side note, the place where I'm teaching this course in Quito in Ecuador, it's a series of caves 
And the architect who constructed these caves made them so each one is vibrates to a certain tone. It, it has a sympathetic vibration. So wow. he took that concept that you're talking about and he implemented it in this modern um, setting, right? So, yeah, I think there's a lot of correspondences with music and with architecture. And in a way, that would go back to Pythagoras and, and then later to Kepler, who they talked about the music of the spheres. Yeah. Because they saw they they felt that the, that music was movement. And so if you're talking about movement of planets, then this also is a type of music. But it's it's a music not that is audible to the ear, but that you feel it in your soul. And I think the same. I, you know, I think there were a lot of metaphysical uh, principles operating in the construction of these ancient temples, I mean, pyramids, all kind of things like that, um, because the 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 vibration, the science of vibration, is pretty mysterious, and uh, you know, I mean, you watch Graham Hancock or you know any of these people talking about. Um, the possibilities of how things were constructed, like very heavy objects that were moved. There was a, a guy in the, in the 40s, I think. His name was Ed Lead Scallon. He yep. was a Latvian immigrant. And he constructed, you can go see this. It's, it's in Florida. It's a site that you can go visit. It's called, it's in Homestead, Florida. It's called Coral Castle. And I wrote about this in, in my book, For the Curious. And and this this guy was like four feet tall. He had a sixth grade education. And he constructed these edifices out of tons of, of coral stone. I mean, weighing like lots of, weighing tons. And he constructed you know, like a door that you can move it with one finger on a on a stone hinge that he made. It's everything's made out of stone in this place. And it has this incredible energy. You 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 go and you sit on the stone chair and you're like, how can a stone chair be comfortable? People don't want to get up from these things. You're <laughs> waiting in line, like just to sit in the stone chair, you know. So um he's people he he constructed this at night because he didn't allow anyone to watch him and when people asked him how did you do this you know we don't see you with any machinery or i mean how did, how did you move these stones and all he said was that he had discovered the secrets the ancient secrets of gravity and electromagnetism yeah i love that so, the, Greg was just at Coral Castle. Who was? Carl. Would. Oh, was he? Wow. We, I can't believe we haven't been there yet. Yeah, we should go. You guys have to go. It's an amazing place. Yeah. So, do you, do you have anything else to talk about? Or what about the hurts? Like the, um, you know, the I've heard you mentioning. I want to give a shout out to uh, to Ulysses. Uh, he was sure. he's the one that connected connected us, and I think his his podcast is called "The Meaning of Music and Mystery" or "Music: The Meaning and Mystery." I think music meaning and mystery. And mystery yeah, um, and uh, yeah, you guys had a fantastic chat, and and I don't know if it was there or another video that I saw you on talking about um, you know the hertz, the the four thirty two, the five twenty. I mean, that's really getting popular with the healing frequencies and. And there's some people that, you know, they call this the devil's note that's 528 and 741 together. I mean, there's also the conspiracy about when they change it from four, four from 432 to 440 in the in the 1930s or 40s, I think. What's your feeling about all, all this stuff going on? Well, uh, first of all, this is another reason that I want to teach this course, because there's a lot of, you know, crap out there, a lot of bullshit <laughs> that people are putting out that don't they don't know what they're talking about and they're making youtube videos that people are watching and and whatever and there there is 
uh, a lot to it. But um, I, I, I don't like the way um, some people are marketing this stuff. Uh, it, they do it in a very superficial way, and they don't really explain what the underlying uh, strength of the concept is. So let's take, let's take 432 hertz, for example. So people say 432 hertz, oh, it's the frequency of nature. And um, there's people that say, oh, the Nazis decided to make it into uh, tuning A instead of tuning A to 432, they tuned it to 440. Well, you know, what does this mean? So Hertz is just cycles per second, right? It's how many, how many vibrations in a second. And so A440 means that the note A is vibrating at 440 times per second, as opposed to 432 or any of the other numbers that have been used in the past as a reference to tune everything to. And it's kind of a complex subject because we use a, a tuning system called equal temperament where all the notes, all the, the half half steps are the same distance apart. So does that mean the whole like scale came up a step? Well, if you go back to like Bach's time or Mozart's time, the tuning was lower. Like the note that we call A today, that was really it's more like an A flat. So you know, not a full it, step, like a half step? It, it could have been as much as, as a half step or even more. So the tuning, key, the, the pitch um, keeps rising. And so does the volume, by the way. I can't believe the onstage and offstage volume, how loud it is now. It, it, you know, I mean, over, you know, 40 years of being in the music business. And I think people are looking for, they want to feel the vibration in the body. Yeah. That's they yeah. want it loud, right? Well, I, to be fair, I think you guys would have had that shit in the 60s too. You just, the speakers would sound like shit, you know? You just <laughs> kind of always been as loud as you could get it and still not lose the clarity. Right. Now, my truck gets so loud, I can't even turn it up all the way. And it still sounds perfect. Right, like always pushing the limits of the equipment, right? Yeah, whenever I was, I was a kid, you couldn't like turn my shit up past like, you know, if it went to 30, you could go to like 17 or 18 before it started like, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, the, no, the equipment definitely can sustain more now. And so, of course, we're humans, right? We like to push envelopes. So we keep going for that. But um, yeah, the tuning... Uh, you know, string players, orchestras. If you go to Europe, the orchestras tune even higher than they do in the United States. Uh, string players like the brilliance when the when when the pitch is higher. Um, the orchestras, uh, you know, the conductors and the musical directors, the artistic directors, they like that that it sounds punchier when it's tuned higher. And so we're we're dealing with all that too. And, you know, meanwhile, you got people saying, oh yeah, 432, it's a sound of, it's what nature tunes to, you know? So does that mean I can go outside and my frog, the tree frogs out there, are, they're tuned to 432? I don't know. Is the pitch rising? Yes, it is. But is 432 the magic nature number? That's pretty debatable. I think it was so. I think it was more to do with a sacred number, but Graham might have something to do with that. I so I never heard the like the thing about nature to go along with it. I, I've just heard that it was like it was just better for us. It was like, but it resonated I mean, with us. It was a resonant frequency for us. I think is what the thing was. But I mean, you're not listening to fucking A notes all day, so that doesn't make any fucking sense. I mean, what about every other note? Well, what we are listening to all day long is that that 60 hertz hum, you know, of every appliance, um, every motor vibrating at 60 hertz. And we don't realize it, but that has permeated our bodies, you know. So uh, we have had scientists in the past that worked on frequency healing 
like uh, Raymond Reif was was one of them. And he he was able to figure out the frequency of parasites, bacteria, viruses, and then uh, project a, and uh, that fr uh, the same frequency onto them to kind of nullify them. And he cured cancer patients. And of course he was uh, nailed to the cross like uh, they did to Wilhelm Reich and, you know, other. Uh, <laughs> what's the, isn't there a new Reich machine? What's the, what's the new fancier one? Well, well, here, here's the thing. There's people working on this now, but I have also heard uh, some researchers say that the frequencies that Rife used back then aren't going to work anymore because we have our bodies, the bodies of all the humans on the planet have been affected by all the electromagnetic radiation. So our bodies have changed and, and the way that our bodies are reacting to uh, pathogens has changed and maybe the the uh, pathogens themselves have changed. So we really, I think we need a lot of ongoing research into this, but there's a, there's some uh, companies who are using some, even on apps on a phone that they analyze your voice, the frequencies in your voice. And then they uh, are able to determine w where is the weak point in your body based on the frequencies in your voice. And then they give you some counter frequencies to, to kind of sing or Which hum. The same, the same principle as Rife's doing in a way? Yeah, basically it is. Basically it is. So it's, there's, there's a lot of investigation that we could, that we could do with this. It's, it's really um, a very, it, it, yes, it's, you, you could go forever with this. And I don't know how many scientists there are out there who are studying this, but I think it's a, a field that's really worthy of very deep investigation. It's like somatics for people. Right. Like analyzing the frequencies because everything is frequency. Everything yeah. is vibration. Yeah. Like Tesla said. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and uh, I don't know if you guys have, have followed this at all, but there's a lot of um, mind control stuff going on with frequencies that the CIA is using, governments are using, uh, police are using to control for crowd control. How are they doing? Are they doing that through that? Uh, is that those sound cannons that they have like those, those things? Yeah, they have those. And uh, but even uh, do you guys remember the the scientist John Lilly? I'll yep. take your hand cannon. Yep. The the Any dolphins day. and the and the and the uh, sensory deprivation tanks, right? Exactly, exactly. So he was working with the dolphins, and he discovered um, a wave that he could use to apply to because what they were trying to do is communicate with the dolphins. So they had electrodes on the dolphin brains. But that disturbed their brains, wow. you, you, you know, to, to keep having this um, uh, electromagnetic pulse going through their brain. So John Lilly figured out a wave that could be played through the electrode that nullified the negative effects of the electrode so that they could keep applying Wasn't the electrode. Wasn't he high on acid, too, at the time? Sorry? Wasn't he the acid guy, too? He was fucking high? Oh, he... <laughs> He was into um, ketamine, actually. Right. Later, later in his life, and you ever, he, been this K, you ever hit the K hole? Yeah, he he did some pretty wild experiments with that. But you know, and everybody says about him, oh, you know, he's crazy, but he's a genius. I mean, so, those psychedelics will bring you to the brink. I've been into the K hole only one time, and I never uh, tried ketamine again while driving. I was not driving. I was I was in shotgun, but the driver was also. Uh, we both ended up in the K hole, so we had to pull off and uh, like just hide out. And was like in in southern Ontario, there's not really like any place to pull off. You know, it's like just it's kind of like probably like being around. I don't know. I've never been to California, but it's just like 
Toronto to fucking Detroit and the other way as far as Peterborough, it's all just like one big city, you know? It's not really, but it's like a metropolis. So it's just you go from one city, now you're in another city, now you're in another city, but you're not really like you haven't not seen buildings the entire time. And uh, there was really just no place to pull off. But I remember, like, the shit was getting dark for a minute. And we had to, like, pull up. But in the end, we were laughing. I just, I don't remember. I remember coming up a hill, and we couldn't fucking drive anymore. We were laughing. We were chuckling. We were just like, what the fuck? So we just, like, pulled off. And, like, in the woods there, just, I don't know what went down after that. I kind of blacked out. And then we just sort of, you know, hit the road again. And my buddy was getting back into the, that shit like a few days later. And I was like, you know, I've never done it since. Yeah, it yeah, sounds like you need a break after that. Yeah, yeah. But So I didn't have any John Lilly style breakthroughs. That's I guess that's the point of the story. It's, it didn't happen for me. I have had some pretty profound breakthroughs on mushrooms and acid, but the, the K hole is not a good experience for me. I don't know how anyone could navigate that. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's not something I would uh, want to try myself, but John Lilly invented this wave and the wave is coming through your TV. Now it's coming through the power grid and it, it's basically a, a an entrainment wave because um you know how people go on and uh use alpha waves and because you you have these different the binaural brain beats waves. and stuff yeah yeah the binaural beats and um th this entrainment wave that john Lilly invented is it's coming through your tv it's probably coming through the, the cell phone it's coming through the computer it's being broadcasted on the public without disclosing that, well, that it's done wow well let's let's bef before, okay how, how do you know how many hertz it is um i have a copy of it uh that i downloaded but i don't remember the exact frequency so, oh that's my assistant so what happened, what how, happened with how many how many hertz is the john lily wave i'd have to way? I have to look uh, that up. Oh. I got a guy to ask. I got Darren, a guy Darren's ask. asking his assistant. Okay. Um, so in the meantime, John Lilly, uh, what happened to him after he after he fixed that dolphin problem, so that the they could uh, continue on? How did that go after that then? Well, th then he was upset because he thought they were abusing the dolphins, and so he quit. You know, he's working for the National Institute of Health. And, and he quit and he started his own foundation and his own um, uh, research company. And, but didn't, wasn't, weren't they doing experiments and stuff that they, that he didn't want to be involved in, or was that the abuse that you're talking about? Um, yeah. Well, what happened was um, various government agencies kept trying to contact him to, to work for them. And he just, he didn't want to do that because he knew what they were up to. You know, right, it was right. all about control, all about weaponizing um, these, uh, these frequencies. Right. And did he end up finding out about the entrainment way of work while working on dolphins? And then, and then they stole that, like, not that they stole it, but you know, they, they used his discovery. Well, what happened was, um, he didn't realize that they had started deploying this wave on the public. He didn't know that he was visiting a friend. This guy, this friend's name was Adam Trombley, who's also a, uh, a researcher. And there's a very interesting interview with Catherine Austin Fitz uh, interviewing this guy, Adam Trombley, where she, where they're talking about entrainment and, and frequencies and the effect that it has on you. And he was visiting Trombley and I guess he was, you know, sleeping in the upstairs bedroom. He comes downstairs and Trombley has his television set hooked up. Uh, and there's a computer and monitors and equipment and there's a wave on the screen. And John Lilly says, where did you get that wave? And Adam Trombley says, 
I didn't I didn't get it anywhere. It's just coming through the TV set. And John Lilly said, that's my wave that I invented to use on the dolphins. So that's he how they found out. Bitches. Yeah. So, was he high? No. I wonder where the kid. I mean, I wish he was. I wish we could interview. Okay. I got this from uh, my assistant. He can okay. be a liberal bootlicker at times, but he's been okay some sometimes. Um, entrainment refers to the synchronization or alignment of biological rhythms or brain waves with an external stimulus, such as a sound or light. When it comes to brainwave entrainment, specific frequencies are often associated with different states of consciousness. Delta waves are 0.5 hertz to 4 hertz, associated with deep sleep and consciousness and healing. Theta waves are 4 hertz to 8 hertz. Uh, deep relaxation, meditation, creativity and, creativity, and enhanced learning. Alpha waves, 8 to 13 hertz, with relaxed, calm state of mind, experienced during light meditation or daydreaming. Uh, beta waves, 13 hertz to 30 hertz, active thinking, alertness, and focused concentration. And gamma waves, 30 hertz and above. So I don't know if that answers a question or not, but that's what this... Uh, AI assistant told me. Well, so think about it. Um, what have we been experiencing in society? Big apathy, right? Like people just kind of submitting to more and more authoritarian and totalitarian rules and restrictions. So alpha wave entrainment that's that's what you get when you're watching TV. That's why you, you don't turn off the TV. You just keep watching. The commercial comes on. You keep watching it. You know, your cell phone, you keep scrolling. You keep scrolling. The computer, you keep, even when you're past the point of being interested in it, because it's it's hypnotic. You're being entrained. So physically, like physically. Yeah, your brain waves are being entrained. Yeah. It's interesting to hear you describe it so scientifically kind of in a, in a way, because it's always been sort of, you know, one of those conspiracies. Oh, you know, your TV's like doing that, but it is releasing a frequency, right? And they've been doing this since the fifties. You, you remember the subliminal advertising uh, scandal, you know, they started showing just microsecond frames of advertising and um, then they got greedy and said, oh, let's show more. And then people started noticing it. Hey, you know, hey, what was that? You know. <laughs> so it, it, it's, um, it's all out there. This, all this technology is being deployed on the public. And, um, and this is also going to be a component of my course because I want people to understand the real power that frequencies have and how they've been weaponized, but also how we can use, use this knowledge for our own benefit to enhance our own health and, and our own, um, uh, our own sort of state of being, because we can use it for that. Like with the binaural beats, I did the hollow sync oh, meditation. Yeah. For, for I did the whole program six years, and I th I think it's a fantastic program. And it was invented by Robert Monroe, who's the guy from Out of Body, you know, Journeys Out of the Body, and he was an audio engineer. He worked for NBC, so he was fooling around with audio equipment at his house, and he started going into altered states spontaneously. And he was consulting doctors. Finally, he got to a doctor who, and he, he explained what was going on. And this particular doctor said, you know, you're not crazy. You don't worry about it. You're, you're experiencing um, brainwave entrainment from your <laughs> audio equipment experiments. And that's how he invented Hemisync, which was the first binaural B program. Um, and, you know, now there's other programs that use the same technology. I, I myself used the Holosync. I thought it was fantastic. It's a great meditation aid. 
which was taken seriously by the government. I mean, they, they have the whole, there's a 1983 paper called uh, Project Gateway or Gateway Analysis that right. that talks about the, the science behind all that. And they talk about the Monroe Institute and and the remote viewing. And yeah, it's fascinating. In 2023, they moved on to Project Gateway. Okay. CIA has been using this stuff for, you know, as long as it as long as they knew about it, I like to say you didn't think the Manchurian Candidate was fiction, did you? Yeah, yeah. So let's talk well, about. I mean, more. not just the CIA. I mean, you know, all those like, uh, what's that? Sorry, all uh, the other cultures and governments and like that shit in Cuba where people's ears were all fucked up. Remember that? Yeah, that was the the Havana syndrome thing. So that that was like 2016, 2017, right? And they couldn't understand what was going on. And they they finally figured it out. They were being targeted with microwave pulses. You know, so, all of these frequencies on the electromagnetic spectrum um, are they're really really powerful, and we really should be aware of how they're being deployed and how. Um, how we might w want to protect ourselves from these things. Is there, so what you talked about the 60 Hertz hum. Is there a way to, to uh, negate that? Tin foil hat, bro. <laughs> you know, you, you just have to be aware of it. Um, once you become aware of it, you know, you can take some steps to um, isolate your appliances and, and things like that. You know, a lot of people have loud refrigerators. I do. But it's all over. I mean, it's the power grid. You yeah. know, yeah. And, and we are being influenced by that. Yeah. What's, Darren, do you got any questions? I had them, but I forgot it. What, well, let's get into your course. Let's get into the depths of your course a little bit more then. Well, talk in about, the course, because it's it's more like a, I mean, you it's an intensive course, right? A few solid days, um, almost as much as a semester of academic work. Yeah, it's a it's a five day intensive, and what I tried to do was kind of condense all of the ideas. I'm going to bring up the program here if I can find it. Um, I'm trying to condense everything into. Uh, bite-sized chunks as it were so that the overall you know the totality of the presentation can can come across but it's going to be very interesting and I'm going to have videos uh, we're going to have live cymatics demonstrations in case people don't know what that is that's um, there was a, a scientist named Hans Yeni and he figured out how to take sound waves, tones, and make them appear as um, designs in a medium like sand or iron filings and things like that. And his work was based on another guy who came before him called Clodney. And uh, it's really amazing when you see the diagrams that the tones make in the medium, it's, it's like watching sound. And I don't mean like waves, like you would see on your your audio program. It's not it's not that. It's actual designs, circular designs, and snowflake designs, and all kinds of things. Yeah, there you go. So that's going to be a component. And uh, Juan Alfonso, who's the owner uh, and the the architect who built these caves, and this. International Arts Center, where we're going to be doing the course, he has built his own cymatics machine. So we're actually going to be doing this live, which is going to be really cool. So there's all kinds of, you know, we're going to be talking about um, the functions of music in society and the function of musicians in society. And there's a lot of different aspects to it. What's going on with this fucking two speed shit? I mean, my kids are on to it, and clearly it's a thing if Spotify's got an entire playlist to all these songs played at double speed. What is going on, Sue? Oh oh yeah, I've I've seen a little bit of that. I don't know, maybe because the world is speeding up and people want to catch up with it. 
But it all sounds like the chipmunk said. I mean, it's right. Like, yeah. I know it is weird. It is weird. But here, you know, we're we're constantly being bombarded with these algorithms all the time. AI is, you know, AI is not going anywhere. It's just going to get stronger, more powerful, and more controlling of all of our daily lives, right? So part of my mission is to not to not to try to get rid of AI because that's impossible. But what are, what are real musicians going to bring to the table that AI can't do? And the only thing that we can bring to the table that AI cannot do is to under, really understand and be able to communicate the metaphysical aspects of music. So, you know, we're going to be talking about different tuning systems. There's a lot of different tuning systems. People don't even know anything about that. Um, the manipulation of emotions that uh, happens with, with music, um, different, uh, how different art forms, how they can combine with music. Um, the, the, it's a whole, it's like a whole college course here that I had all the modules. Which one's your favorite? I would say I love you know uh, everything on here is stuff that I that I like to talk about because I've been researching it for a long time. I I would say probably the the functions of of music in society and the function of musicians in society, I think is a, a pretty important thing because everyone needs to, I, I wish that everyone could understand what their role is in society like they did in, um, let's say in Native American, you know, tribal situations, tribal societies. Even a little kid knows what their role is. You know, so your role is to go out hunting or your role is to keep the teepee in order or your role is to clean the corn. You know, everyone has responsibilities in a tribal society. And because we don't have we don't live in tribal societies anymore. People don't know what their responsibilities are. And I think a lot of people feel lost, especially the young people. Well, they're listening to music at two times speed. I mean, that doesn't get you lost fast. I mean, it seems, it seems crazy to me. If anything, the older I get, the slower my musical tastes have got. And as far as the AI thing goes, I mean, the 80s, were, was that was when did the auto-tuner come out? That was kind of like AI, wasn't it? AI, I, like drum machines, drum machines, and drum machines you know the the thing i just said the auto tune for the voices you know that that was all sort of the i mean in a lot of ways ai has been infiltrating the music industry for a long long time yeah it has i remember when the lynn drum which was the first electronic uh, drum program i remember when that came out and being in the recording studio and having a producer apply that <laughs> to a track and it used to do this thing called quantizing because it couldn't divide up the the notes small enough so it would have to just kind of slot them in to the spaces that it had available for the rhythms right and i remember it came up with this really bizarre rhythm one time just because it quantized um the track in a way that isn't the way a human would have done it but it was interesting but would you want to listen to that all day i don't know now you'll notice it's uh, you'll notice all of it like they can fool you with even that AI and whatever they're calling it, deep fake. Whatever. They'll fool you with that on like a quick clip if you're not paying attention. 
But if you have to listen to an hour of that, I would say not even an hour. I mean, I got a pretty good ear for it. I listened to a ton of spoken word between the audio books and the podcast and Graham. You know, it's like you can pick it up. I pick it up pretty quick. There's like a, there's a cadence missing to it. Uh, yeah, cadence, exactly. Sorry. But, you know, though it's come a long way. I, you know, I got we got buddies like, you know, Max singing all the time. He's in the chance. Mac, a shout out to Mac. And we got bass Taz. He's a musician. And then, uh, like, of course, Brothers of the Serpent. But uh, I lost uh, I lost the question that I was going to do with that. But it's like um, if our, our buddy Kevin Alves does all sorts of crazy stuff. Like, if this stuff would have been at the level it's at now when I was, you know, there was a point when I was serious about it. But it was still hard to do. Like, you go rent a recorder to kind of get everything recorded, but it was a, it was a real expense. So you're there and you're kind of hammering it out for a weekend. Whereas now you can just have all this stuff all the time. If you just have a computer, like uh, the game's really changed. I'm surprised it's that it's interesting that the field hasn't got a little more competitive, but at the same time, I guess, you know, like most of my favorite, favorite, favorite musicians nowadays are people that other people have never heard of that have smaller following. So I suppose in some ways it, it has. Yeah, my, my favorite platform is Bandcamp. I love exploring on on Bandcamp. I don't even put most of my stuff on Spotify or anything. I mean, Spotify is a horrible model for musicians. And really, most of those um, platforms are, are pretty terrible. You know, the way that we learned about music, um, having vinyl albums and just memorizing the liner notes and learning the names of all the musicians and playing the records over and over. And on the radio, the announcers would tell you the name of the song and who was playing on it. And, you know, that's how we learned about, about music. And you don't have any of that now. All you know is the leader, the band leader's name, their name is on the record. You don't even know who's playing on the record. But that's why I like Bandcamp because not only can you download well and you can get physical merch too but you can download the tracks in any format you want any audio format it's not just mp3 you can have wave you can have FLAC, uh aac i think they offer as well and all the liner notes photos videos whatever the band wants to put up there you can download it so it's a platform that kind of lets us go back to those old days of really immersing ourselves in the music that we like. This we're, one time at Bank Camp, <laughs> we, uh, that's actually where we get all our music. I mean, we got Broke for Free. There's a lot of the music on the show. It's all of our interlude music between the guests and the interview. So, you know, we used to jump it around, but then we just sort of settled into a couple of things. So you can get all the Broke for Free stuff at brokeforfree.com or at Bandcamp. And, of course, we got the fabulous Felix Ortega II, who does all of our or 99% of our outro music. We do a lot of the $50 Dynasty stuff, which is Kyle's band, uh, once in a while. But Felix has been making us jingles, and he's sort of been making music for us since day one. And that's where we I get all his stuff is... I think I've bought all his albums like a dozen times off Bandcamp now. And now that now that Bandcamp is owned by Epic, which is kind of a mega company, um, I wish that it wasn't owned by Epic, but that's how it is. And it's still it's still a good platform despite that. What do you what do you see them where do you see the music industry going now in the next five, ten years? Well, I think the the musicians really better start taking control over how they want their music disseminated, how they want to be paid for it and what they want their working conditions to be like when they play live. And if musicians don't do that, uh, I could see in the future kind of a hunger games scenario, like, lock the musicians up in the cage oh okay let them out because the king wants to hear some music for lunch you know that, that kind of thing you know it's like they're they're just gonna con we're just gonna be controlled more and more and more unless now we say no we're not doing that 
but but I mean, let's we don't have to get too deep into this, and I hope you have a little bit more time here. But um, I do. What about uh, like you're in an industry that's fairly woke right now? I mean, you've 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 grown up in this industry. You've been playing it as a professional musician for you know for, I don't know how long, but you've been into it for forty years or whatever. And now, are you seeing like a crazy shift where the musicians, the artists in general, pop culture is like getting super woke? They're going along with their they think they're the resistance, but they're really just following along with the big corporations and what the government's telling them to do. I mean, how do you handle? this environment yeah it, it's very weird graham because um back in the day i mean my field basically is jazz right so the jazz musicians they were the the hip people you know that's who everybody copied they were the ones that set the the fashion trends um they they were the ones that uh, everybody was following they were the ones, you know, and they would say things against the government and they would give their opinions. And now it's the opposite. Now all, of, at least the, the jazz musicians, I see the, them being very formulaic, towing every line that's given to them and just... Oh, you know, you want me to wear a mask while I'm playing the clarinet? Oh, sure. I, I can figure out how to do that. There's people doing that. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, it really, it boggles the mind. It I really thought that was like, it's hard to know if that was just a meme or not, but it's it's disappointing to no, hear that people, people are doing it. I got it's I see pictures, yeah. And I mean, our health, ministers, our health minister said glory holes on national television. I mean, we're, you can't really, you can't get any more ridiculous. Than that, but I mean, it wasn't even just the old jazzers. I mean, we went from the 1990s, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me, that exact band saying just fucking do what they tell you. Exactly. I mean, rage against the machine. I mean, the last people you would ever see selling out, which makes you wonder if the whole industry isn't a bunch of sellouts. I mean, we had Dave McGowan on five or 600 episodes ago, the late, great Dave McGowan, God rest his soul episode 60 or 69 i believe somewhere in there it's in the 60s if people want to go back check that out. it was a fantastic chat and he's talking about all these bands you know being sort of like spooks and you know the older i get the more i'm like he might have been on to something have you heard about his work at all the weird scenes in the canyon no, I'm not familiar with it. He talks about the Laurel Canyon where in the 60s, the late 60s specifically, there was um, like a whole bunch of these musicians. A lot of these prominent musicians had uh, parents in the intelligence uh, community or as like high up in the Army, Navy, like Jim Morrison. There's a whole bunch of them. And they were also using an ex an ex army base for their studio, for a lot of the studio down there. And, and he just, he really made a lot of connections about like, this is kind of just controlled, controlled counterculture in a way. Right. And that, then that's going on today for sure. Yeah. Wow. Another rabbit hole to go down. Oh yeah. That's, yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a good one. That weird. I don't know what's going on with my camera. This. Moment. I think it's, it's since you blew some smoke right on it, you never got focused back in after Allegedly. the big smoke. Yeah. Allegedly. Smoke. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in an a-hole right now. <laughs> Actually, so what I think if, I sniff that stuff. If I remember correctly. I don't remember a hundred percent how I did it. It was either sniff it or you remember you used to take those little balls, a little roll up. You used to call them like parachutes or something like that. They look like little upside down ghosts. No, you guys didn't do a lot of drugs, huh? No, I don't know. We're not. No, we're not resonating with you. <laughs> Dude, this, this has been great. That was just regular old weed I was smoking, just so. Just to be perfectly clear. Okay. Uh, this has been great. An hour has flown by. Where can our people find all your stuff? Can they do you have social media? Do you have a website? All that kind of stuff. Ground put it in the show notes. Only like 20% of people bother reading the show notes. So it's always good to give that URL out right here. And make sure you oh. mention make, make sure you mention your course again. It's an intimate course. There's not it's not a whole ton of people, right? It's a small group in Ecuador in the Andes. Um, for a bunch of days, very intensive. Yeah, five. It's a five day course. It's it's going to be pretty amazing, and it, it's going to be very special. So, 
I, I'm, you know, it's, it's for a small group of people. Uh, they can be musicians or they can just be music fans, you know, because a lot of times music fans are more, they love music even more than the musicians do. So that, that has a, probably the best URL that I would give people is just my website because the link to the course is there and the link to all of my other stuff, my albums and everything is there. So my name is Sue Terry, but it's just S-U. There's no E on the end. So SueTerry.com. Right on. Thanks. Do you think we covered everything or is there anything we missed that you want to mention before we wrap it up? Oh, there's a, there's a million things we missed. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do this again. I would love to. It was so great talking to you guys. Yeah. Yeah. It flew by. It was fantastic. It's uh really love what you're, what you're doing and good luck with your course. Thank you very much. Thanks for having awesome. me on the show. I appreciate right. it. Awesome. Thanks Sue. Have a great night. Thanks guys. Be good. Yeah. And that was a chat with Sue Terry. What'd you think? I love it. It's awesome. There you have it. Someone made the comments about how you were talking about how you cry when you sing, and I didn't seem like I really gave a shit. Well, you, you uh, didn't. You she, don't give a shit. Like, like, yeah, I don't. I tell you, when 80 songs comes on, or even like... Yeah, the the fans, like, you know, sometimes the, people who are listeners, fans. like, I mean, I'm a listener too. I just, uh, you know, I don't get the crying I love, music, dude. I just don't get it. I'm, what? Really? I love I, mean, I love they, music. Dude, I listen to music all day. I probably listen to more music than you do in a day because I'm out and about in my truck, which is the perfect music listening environment i cry with the snake bro sometimes when i sing the snake pros album even like the 50 dollar dynasty i mean if we had like a track on you how often is it how many is it just with music is there other things that make it's you just cry? with music like, mainly that, yeah, like yeah. jumps up yeah. on your shoulder a certain way or? it was like ever since that ray cooper the drummer from elton john in vegas when i cried during his drum well solo, that kind of triggered this whole thing no i'm just kidding it's i've seen you like well up sometimes and there's been no music involved <laughs> <laughs> No, Tell songs will do it, dude. Like, I was going to ask her about the residents, like, the fix, like, if the song from the fix comes on, like that, uh, what's that song called? Uh, um, stand, stand, stand or fall. That first chord sends a shiver down my spine every time. I don't know what song you're talking about. I'll play it and I'll play it for you in the intro. Well, yeah, you can't. That'd be copyright infringement, wouldn't it? It's just a chord. Dude, I haven't, you have one chord. Do you know which chord it is? No, I don't. I wouldn't know anyway. I don't know how to read music, but I could play music half assed. I'm a half assed musician, half assed podcaster, half assed writer, half assed hunter. See, I'd rather be half assed at everything than just like bad at shit, you know? <laughs> anyway, big thanks to Sue for coming on the show. Big thanks to you guys for listening. Even bigger thanks. If you're one of the few, the 1% that choose to support our work, grammarica.ca slash support, episode 610 or something. They're all free. They're all there. No, you know, they're just all there. They're all free. We don't try and really sell you anything. There's a few episodes where we might try and sell you some stuff in the beginning, actually. We tried out a couple different models. There's like a raffle thing that we tried back then. But it's all there. It's all free. If you like it, if it adds some value to your life, to your day, to your commute your workout, to your walk, wherever you're listening, head over to grandamerica.ca slash support today. Sign up for monthly and make a one-time donation, guys. We can't do this without you. We get hungry. We have bills to pay. We have gas to pay so that Graham can drive around singing and crying in his car. Uh, adult Brain for the audiobooks. Contact at the cabin for all the trips. Uh, don't, 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 don't. You're going to get us a strike. We're live, too. That's like a major infraction. <laughs> Uh, we love you guys. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next week. All right, guys, thanks for tuning into the live show. It was an active one. We got some super chats $25 worth of super chats. Thank you, DC Rogers. Thank you, Mac Lorenzo. No rockfin tips. So the rockfin people are slacking. YouTube has pulled way out in front. Uh, I think that's about it. We'll be back. What tomorrow? Are we back tomorrow? Tomorrow, yeah. Tomorrow, uh, 4 p.m. Mountain.